Hey, welcome to Return of the King. This is a series where we're going chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to see what the Bible really has to say about the end of the world. Today is such an important episode, and it's an often overlooked part of the book of Revelation, and it's the latter part of Revelation chapter one. This is that part of Revelation that a lot of people reading or rereading through the book of Revelation will read verse one, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him, and then it's kind of yada, 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 Oh, chapter two. Now let's see what the, the, the Spirit is saying to the churches. But this is a critical part as we see the glorified Christ revealed. This is our first real look at Jesus after the ascension. We get a couple of glimpses through the New Testament, but the book of Revelation gives us the clearest picture of who Jesus is, what he is like right now. And this is an important placement of this as we move into all the events of Revelation, and it's very critical. Uh, just a reminder from the last episode, if you caught that, if you are so focused on getting uh, on the events of Revelation that you miss the Jesus of Revelation, you're kind of missing the point of Revelation. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is certainly from him, but it is very much about him. And really, before we can have a good eschatology, we need to have a good Christology. In other words, before we can truly understand the end times, we need to understand who Jesus is. And that's important for us if we're going through just tribulation in general, or if we happen to go through great tribulation, we need to have this very clear understanding of Jesus. And this is kind of one of those subtle but important principles of the book of Revelation. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Not a made-up version of Jesus, not an idolatrous um, imagination of Jesus, but seeing Jesus as he really is and staying focused on him. This is given at a time when John, uh, the apostle, is being persecuted for the faith. He's being exiled on the island of Patmos. And here is the encouragement that is given to him. If, if you get nothing else out of this, the only way that we can go through the trials and struggles and tribulation of this life uh, faithfully, confidently, with peace, is by keeping our eyes on Jesus. If we take our eyes off of Jesus and we start looking at the circumstances around us, we can get uh, discouraged, uh, despondent, and uh, just really down and out in every way. And here is the key. So let's take a look at who Jesus is. And uh, just a reminder, uh, if you have any questions or comments along the way, please drop those in the comments below. I, I'm glad to answer those when I can. We're about to go through a little bit of transition, moving from our ministry assignment in Italy back to the States. Uh, so I may not get to as many of those uh, right away, but I will try to answer as many as I can uh, when I get back. Uh, so uh, if, if you haven't already, uh, please subscribe. And if you find anything encouraging or helpful or useful in this, if you don't mind, just give a little like. That's the greatest thanks that you can give. I put over 50 hours uh, of study and preparation to every single one of these episodes. And just a little thanks is, uh, goes a long way. And if you want to drop that in the comments as well, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, and feedback. Uh, that really is encouraging to me and interesting to me uh, to see uh, what the Lord is revealing to you as we go through this. So let's dive in. Um, Revelation is a unique book in the entire Bible. Of the 66 books of the Bible, this one is hands down very, very different from all the others because it's written like an epistle, like a letter, um, and it's prophecy uh, very clearly, but it uses a lot of ap apocalyptic imagery. And this means that we have to approach Revelation a little bit differently. And that means also uh, that there may be differences of opinion uh, on some of the different features, but we can still be friends within a range. I mean, there, there are some ideas out there that are just silly and wrong, uh, but just because we might disagree on something doesn't necessarily mean that we can't continue conversation in the same way with people that you know in real life. You don't have to agree 100% on the book of Revelation and what it means in order to stay in fellowship with each other. In fact, if you're letting the book of Revelation separate your fellowship, you got a problem. So um, Revelation uh, is written uh, to seven actual churches in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Uh, so this places it in history with a message for those churches, those believers in John's day. So again, it's written like a letter and the same kind of thing that you see in Paul's letter and Peter's letters. Uh, it says John to the seven churches. Uh, Revelation will actually end like a letter as well. So you can see that all of the visions and prophecies are couched within this letter and it's intended 
and for all of those seven churches to receive that, hear that, and have a great benefit from it. Um, now, here's an interpretive clue. Seven throughout the book of Revelation is one of those numbers that is usually used to indicate completeness and usually even divine completeness. Uh, so we see in Revelation chapter five, Jesus is the lamb who looks like he's been slain and he's described as having seven eyes and seven horns. Now, does Jesus literally have seven eyes? No. Does he have horns at all? No. Uh, this is figurative language that is given to us, but the seven is used to indica indicate that he has complete sight, complete vision. There's nothing that he doesn't know, nothing that he doesn't understand. And the seven horns, he has complete strength, power, authority. Um, horns in the Old Testament uh, in ancient times would represent strength and power. Uh, so when we hear that it's written to the seven churches, we also don't need to limit ourselves to the messages only for those churches, that the whole church is in view, the totality of uh, Christianity, of uh, the church throughout the world and throughout time. And so this is a message for us today. Uh, we don't need to just look and use this as a puzzle and wonder what's going to happen and so forth. But there are very clear things that we need to take away from this about who Jesus is, not just about what Jesus is doing. Uh, so we have that same kind of opening uh, as we see in a lot of letters, grace and peace. Uh, but as we'll notice in just a moment, when I pull up the scripture, you'll hear that these are actually from God. Uh, so this is not like a, a letter from Paul where Paul will say grace and peace to you uh, from me and from Timothy or whoever else happens to be with him. This is actually a greeting from God. And these are words of hope for the persecuted, uh, the words of encouragement. And this is a wonderful thing that God is uh, reminding them. They are not forgotten. They are favored. Oftentimes when we think of people who are persecuted for the faith, we almost kind of feel sorry for them that maybe somehow that uh, they were second class or that, you know, why did God forget them? Why did God allow this bad stuff to happen to them? But Jesus said just the opposite. Blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Uh, this is one of the things that we need to shift in our Western mindset that uh, the reality is health and wealth are not clear indicators of blessing. Uh, being persecuted for Jesus is. Now, not being persecuted because you're an idiot, uh, but being persecuted because you are faithfully living out Christ. You look and you smell like Jesus and the world hates you because of that, because of your stance, that is an indication of blessing, that you so resemble uh, Christ that you have been counted worthy of identifying with the suffering of Jesus. You know, the picture of this guy here, many of you know who this is, very, very wealthy man, but in his autobiography uh, many, many years ago, uh, wrote that when he was a teenager, he thought that uh, he was a God and was uncomfortable with that. Now he's kind of taking comfort with the, uh, that sort of identity. Uh, so very clearly not a man of God and one of the wealthiest men in the world. So this is not a clear indicator of blessing. And if you're listening to that, you need to listen to the whole counsel of scripture, which indicates just the opposite. We will not be always protected from harm, from hurt, from bad times, from pain, from persecution. Uh, in fact, we should expect the opposite, that if we're truly followers of Christ, we will have difficult times. So the, uh, this um, part of the chapter, the, the letter portion opens up with a greeting from the triune God. Uh, Revelation chapter one, uh, starting in verse four, says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Uh, 
And so we have this greeting from the triune God. Notice uh, how this is structured here. Again, it's, it's a greeting from God, and it's a greeting from each person of the Trinity. It's uh, from the Father who is and who was and who is to come. Uh, it is also from uh, the seven spirits, and it is from Jesus Christ. Uh, so we have all three members of the Trinity listed right here. Now, it is a unique order, Father, Spirit, Son. Normally, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in this case, it's flip-flopped. And I think the reason why is the Son is who is going to be emphasized. This is where the rest of chapter 1 and 2 and 3, for that matter, are going to, to take off from. So we have uh, this, again, this identifier of all three, uh, unique order, but the emphasis is on Jesus. So first off, it's from the eternal one. It is from God the Father. Uh, we see this um, description of him being eternal in Exodus 3, Revelation 1, uh, verse 8, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, and then in 11, uh, 17. So this is a theme throughout scripture. Uh, God said to Moses when he revealed his name, I am who I am. This is that sacred name of God, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, as some people would, would say. Uh, this is uh, Exodus 3.14 on Mount Sinai when God revealed himself there. He is the eternal one. There's never been a time when he wasn't. There never will be a time when he's not. And he always exists in the eternal present because he exists outside of time. He is the one who created time. He exists eternally and in eternity, not confined to time. Um, later on, as we have already read, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. When we get over to chapter four, we see the four living creatures that when they fall down to worship at the throne, uh, they cannot get over his holiness. Uh, and they also uh, glorify him because he is the eternal one. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Notice this repetition of Almighty in there as well, that he has always been Almighty. He always will be Almighty. And he is completely holy. Nothing he does is wrong. There is nothing impure in him. This is deep encouragement at the very beginning. Because what it shows us is that God is indeed the eternal one, the almighty one, and the holy one. And he exists outside of history and he controls history. He controls human events and he is bringing them to a, an end that he has already decided. He will bring that about, not human players. They will be used as tools to bring that about, but it is not their initiative that makes it happen. Uh, human leaders are not the ones that are directing uh, clearly, purely uh, on their own power to bring things to where they're going. Uh, and it's certainly not even the spiritual forces that may be at work. It is God and God alone. And here's the good news especially the time where it seems like the world is really get crazy and getting crazier by the second. He is in control even when the world seems out of control. Keep your eyes on him. We also see that this is from the seven spirits. So seven spirits, sevenfold spirit, the, we hear both in the book of Revelation, but this is clearly a reference to the Holy Spirit. Uh, seven, again, indicates the fullness, that divine perfection. So we have the Holy Spirit that is in view here. Some people have seen this as an allusion to um, Isaiah 11, 2, and it could be. Uh, and this is where uh, the word of God says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, speaking of the Messiah, and the, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And you're like, me maybe initially reading that, well, how does that work? Well, it's actually seven different descriptions of the Holy Spirit, that he is the spirit of the Lord. He is the spirit of wisdom. He is the spirit of understanding. He is the spirit of counsel. He is the spirit of might, and he is the spirit of knowledge, and he is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. All of those are accurate descriptors uh, of the Holy Spirit. So is that it? Maybe. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but it seems like a, a pretty plausible thing uh, as I look at it. But I do want you to note, the Holy Spirit is not impersonal. He is a person. He is not a force. Um, he is not uh, a mindless sort of... Um, instrument of God, uh, he also sends greetings of peace and grace. Uh, this is important. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. 
So if you're referring to the Holy Spirit as it, you need to remove that from your, your mouth, from your vocabulary, and call him as he truly is. He is a person, uh, not an it. He is not neuter uh, or a thing. Uh, he is the third person of the, the Holy Trinity. Um, and then finally, we see that this is a greeting from Jesus Christ. And we get a little more description here of Jesus. We're told three things about who Jesus is, and then we're told three things about what Jesus does. So let's look at who he is. That he is uh, from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he's the faithful witness. Jesus did not compromise in the face of opposition or death. So he is a great example for us in times of tribulation, even in persecution. Uh, he remained faithful, and so can we. Here's the other thing. What Jesus has revealed uh, in all of time, and especially here in the book of Revelation, is always accurate, true, and reliable. This is a contrast to the great dragon in Revelation chapter 12, who is a liar, a deceiver, and he uses deception as his key tool. Second thing is he is the firstborn of the dead. This is more likely a reference to his authority, not chronology. He has authority over death. Yes, he is the first who is resurrected uh, from the grave, never to die again. Uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead, and as far as we know, he died again. Elijah raised uh, somebody, and they probably died again. Uh, so he is probably, yes, the first one to rise and never die again, um, but it's certainly not the first one in order of people coming back to life. More importantly is this idea of authority. Firstborn is the concept of authority, of privilege, of place. Exodus 4.22, when Moses first encountered uh, Pharaoh and he's telling him, let my people go, uh, God speak, speaking through uh, Moses refers to Israel as his firstborn. Uh, now, if you know the story, uh, Jacob is not the firstborn, Esau is, so Jacob's name also became Israel. Israel as a nation was not the first of all nations to be on planet earth. There were many, many more before and have been many since. This is more that idea of position, power, and authority. Uh, and, and by the way, he has the authority over death. And so that means Christians need not ever, ever fear death. Not death in a natural way, not death in a way because we're facing a firing squad, you know, re uh, recount, uh, uh, renounce your faith in Jesus or die. Uh, even in situations like that, we never need fear death. He is the one who has conquered death. He is the one who holds the keys of death and Hades. He is also the ruler of the kings of the earth. Here's a key theme in the book of Revelation. He rules over all earthly rulers and the satanic powers behind them. This is a present reality. And so we can be confident that even though we're seeing chess pieces moved across the board and boundaries changing and power structures changing and so forth, behind this is the working out of God's ultimate plan to bring things to where he ultimately wants them to be doesn't mean that all the minute details are because God is bad and wants bad things to happen. That's not the point of this. The second part of this introduction is what Jesus has done. Uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to uh, him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So number one, he loves us. Now notice this is present tense. His love is permanent. Present tense in Greek is ongoing. Uh, and there is uh, nothing that stops his love. It is an amazing thing. Sometimes when we get into the middle of hard times, we think, why doesn't God love us? Listen, Jesus demonstrated his love once and for all fully for us on the cross. He could not do a better expression of his love than that. If you're ever wondering if God loves you, if you're ever wondering if Jesus loves you, look to the cross. Even in the midst of hard times, this is one of those things that we preach to ourselves. The present tense reality is that Jesus has not stopped loving me. You might need to hang on to that. I think somebody needed to hear that today. Uh, second is he has freed us from our sins by his blood. His saving work is finished. It is a perfect tense. That means it happened in the past with ongoing results. If you come to a place where you realize that you're a sinner, that you need a savior and that savior is Jesus, and you've repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, and this is the reality you live in. And, and this is incredible. He has purchased us, bought us, freed us by his blood. Again, 
no greater love than this. Third, he's not only saved us, but he's elevated us to this prized position that he has made us a kingdom and priests. Our present reality, if we're in Christ, we are citizens now in the kingdom of heaven with direct access now to the king. We don't have to have a human priest to go between us. We don't have to have a person standing between us and God. Jesus is our great high priest, and he has made the way possible by his blood through his death on the cross so that we can have direct access to the throne room of grace. That is great news. So here are two major themes that are being revealed about Jesus. Number one, Jesus is already the king. He's not going to become the king. He is the king right now. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. What we see in Revelation 19, when he comes on that white horse, bearing that, um, uh, that, that indicator of he is the king of kings and lord of lords, that doesn't wait until Revelation 19. This is the reality of his now. Second, Jesus is visibly coming back to finalize the already inaugurated kingdom. Uh, verse 7, we see that. He is coming back and every eye will see him. Um, Revelation 1, uh, 7, uh, I, I forgot I had that here, sorry. Uh, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. This kind of takes us back to Daniel chapter seven, same of the same kind of language. Remember a huge percentage, about 20% of the book of Revelation is clear allusions to the Old Testament. And I think this is one of those right here of Daniel chapter seven, verse 13. Uh, Daniel says, I saw in the night visions and behold, the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented to him. Fact, uh, chap, uh, verse 14, uh, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is an important thing that would be in the minds of a, a Jewish background believer, someone who understood the Hebrew scriptures would hear this, he's coming in the clouds and have this ancient of days picture in mind. So now we get to verse nine, which is that first vision of the glorified Christ. And there's a lot in here. And this really seems to be that uh, fulfillment of that high priestly prayer of Jesus in um, John 17, uh, where Jesus, right before going to the cross, uh, says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So what we're about to see is the glorified Jesus, that he's no longer the humble servant that has emptied himself of some of that glory that he had before, or at least the, the, the ready uh, uh, presence of that glory. We got one glimpse of his glory in the Mount of Tra Transfiguration, where he appeared uh, with uh, Moses and Elijah. And it says that he, his face shone like the sun. Uh, so here was just kind of a glimpse that Peter, James, and John got it. The same John that's writing this and seeing Jesus now had seen Jesus in that glimpse of his glory then. So let's look at the glorified Jesus starting in verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are 
and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we now come to John uh, revealing this vision that he has. This is kind of what has initiated this whole process of the book of Revelation. And he calls himself a fellow sufferer, a, a partner in tribulation. And there's just something significant here. Uh, and this is two key themes really throughout the whole book of Revelation. Number one, tribulation is the norm for God's people in this age. So this is written during that first real period of, or second real period of uh, tribu tribulation by the Roman Empire against Christians. But this all harkens back to what Jesus promised in John chapter 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have tribulation. And just in case your mind wants to kind of play word games, this is the exact same word that's used in the phrase, great tribulation. So it doesn't matter if we're facing tribulation in the general sense or great tribulation, we will have this, and this is the norm for the Christian life. The fact that we have had uh, kind of a period of peace in the Western world uh, in Christianity is abnormal, not normal. What we are reverting back to right now is more normative for Christianity. Hang on to that, because this is an important reality that will help us from getting discouraged and help us to connect better with our brothers and sisters from the first century onward that endured so much for the sake of the name. And, and that, that's, that's one of those hard realities, but it's one that we need to come to grips with. And the second is related to that, is then that is patient endurance is the expectation and encouragement of the entire book of Revelation. When Jesus was talking about the end in Matthew chapter 24, that same theme is there. He who endures to the end will be saved. We'll talk more about that. And I think I might even do an episode on that word, hupomone. It's the Greek word for endurance and how much that comes up um, and, and really into play throughout the book of Revelation. But we don't even just see it there. We also see in Romans 12, 12, Paul says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And he gives us the solution. How do we be patient in, in tribulation? We rejoice in hope and we're constant in prayer. That's how we can be patient in tribulation. So the uh, patience and tribulation sandwich, um, not an easy one to swallow sometimes, but the bread on that is the key. Rejoice in hope hope. We have the hope of salvation. We have the hope of the coming King, and we are constant in prayer. And that keeps our eyes focused on Jesus. That is the key. So looking at the details of um, the vision of Jesus, uh, this is what we see. Now, going into this, we need to remember that a picture is worth a thousand words. And there is a lot of figurative language that's employed to describe the glory and the power and the authority of Jesus. It's not intended to tell us how Jesus literally looks today. Uh, so if you were to uh, somehow be uh, transported to heaven, it is highly unlikely uh, that if you were to see Jesus in his true form, that he would look like what we're about to see here in uh, this description in Revelation 1. Uh, you know, part of the description is that he has a sword that comes uh, from his mouth. Jesus does not literally have a metal blade for a tongue. Uh, I, I, this is intended to convey something. Uh, it's intended to relate to us about who Jesus is, not how he literally works. So this is where we need to kind of take a step back and look at it. Ah, this is what uh, Revelation is trying to convey, what it's trying to message about who Jesus is. Uh, fun picture here. This is way back in uh, August of 2017, the first uh, great American eclipse. We drove six hours uh, up to Missouri from Arkansas at that time, 12 hours round trip to see two minutes and 42 seconds of an astronomical event. And I got to tell you, it was absolutely worth it. I was not prepared. I'd seen pictures um, uh, online and so forth. And, and by the way, if you have never experienced that, I hope that you get that opportunity, but you've got to be directly under the totality. Being close is not it. So if you say, well, I was you know, just a few minutes away from that and it just was kind of ho-hum, uh, you don't know what you missed. And I was fully unprepared that that moment that the 
the moon slipped across fully the sun. We're wearing these, you know, super protective, cool looking glasses there. Um, and it, when it went total, uh, total black, you couldn't see anything. So you take the glasses off. And I never had an emotional experience like that just by looking at something. I mean, I was very emotional when my kids were born and it was amazing and wonderful. This was breathtaking. There has never been anything in nature that has just made me weep like this. And unless you've seen it, I can't describe it. And this is why uh, when I went, I was unprepared because no one had ever explained or described accurately the beauty in that moment. The 360 rainbow that surrounded the horizon near the ground, the way that the all of nature, every insect and bird did like this holy hush right before uh, the, the eclipse. It was an incredible moment. And John is having an even more incredible moment. And some of the things that we see throughout the book of Revelation is a struggle, one, to describe what he's seeing that is so vastly different uh, with familiar language to us. And the other is that part of this is given intentionally. Jesus is intentionally uh, revealing himself in this way so that we can understand more of his majesty, more of his glory, more of his power than if he just simply appeared as he would look in a normal kind of way. Um, and we use images even today. Uh, uh, King Charles here on the right side of your screen, he's holding an orb. If you go throughout history, uh, even back to ancient uh, Greek and Roman times, you will see rulers holding this orb, which represents authority. Um, and, and we'll also see this pineapple. Now, uh, many people will see this pineapple and they just think, well, that's cool, uh, and not realize this is kind of the universal symbol of hospitality. And it goes back to when uh, ships began to uh, trade in some of the tropical areas, and they would bring it back these pineapples and these unrefrigerated ships. So the wealthy who were uh, fortunate enough to be able to get one would invite friends over, and it was certainly an attractive centerpiece. But these things would cost about the equivalent of $5,000 each. And it was an incredible display of hospitality at the end of that meal for the host to cut up that pineapple and share this $5,000 piece of fruit with his guest. And so we use symbols even now. So this is not an uncommon thing, but one of the keys to understanding the symbols is asking what would they have meant to the original recipi recipients of this? What would it have meant to the first century hearers of this not 21st century me? Uh, so we don't want to read our ideas into uh, these images. We want to let scripture speak into what those are. Cool thing is some places in Revelation, we're told what they mean. Even here, we're told what a couple of the things are. Others, we need to compare to the rest of the Old Testament. And some of them, we don't have a clear idea. Get comfortable with unclear in the book of Revelation. It's okay. God has not told us everything, but what he has told us is sufficient. So the first thing that we hear is this voice like a trumpet. Uh, this is intended to convey a sense of authority. It's commanding. It's loud. It's clear. It's penetrating. Uh, it grabs the attention. Uh, and this could be an allusion even to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. When we're hearing about God appearing, there's the sounding of trumpets. Uh, and we often hear the voice of God uh, being described in this way. So we have this comparison or this use of this uh, figurative language to compare the voice of Jesus to the voice of God. This is messaging a little bit about who Jesus really is. He is divine. He is God. Uh, we see that he is like the Son of Man. Uh, this, again, is an allusion to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. There came one like a Son of Man. Uh, uh, John was understanding a little bit about who this one is. He had this long robe with a golden sash. Now, this one is a little bit unclear because we do have some angels clothed in the same way, and they're clearly not the same thing. Uh, just to be clear, Jesus is not an angel. Just read Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, he is the creator of angels. He is not an angel. Uh, and so this could represent kingship or even priesthood. Priests would wear, uh, like we see in Exodus 28, a golden sash. Uh, and I think really there's uh, maybe a, a, a weaving together of multiple things coming together in one is that Jesus is indeed the expected prophet, priest, and king. When no one in the Old Testament was able to fulfill 
these three key positions are all filled in Jesus. And we see this with the golden sash and the, the robe. He had white hair and, uh, and like flaming fire, his eyes like flaming fire. And these are uh, descriptions of the ancient of days. Uh, verse nine of Daniel seven says, and I, uh, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took a seat. His clothing was white as snow and his hair was like uh, a head uh, or uh, his the hair of his head, can't read, the hair of his head um, was like pure wool and his throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Same type of imagery that we see. We're closely connecting. Who is being talked about in Daniel 7 is the same one who's appearing here in Revelation 1. Um, now, his feet like a, like burnished bronze, this is intended to represent his glory. This is that glowing bronze picture. Uh, and it's uh, this irresistible strength that he stands in judgment. We see this in Revelation 14, where his feet press, treads the wine press of the wrath of God, that he is the one who crushes his enemies like grapes. Now, burnished bronze and white hair are not intended to tell us about the race or the age of Jesus. Um, I'm amused when people will say, see, he had feet like um, burnished bronze, and he had white hair. See, he was a black man. I, I, that's not what's trying to be uh, conveyed here. Um, more silly is people seeing white hair, and they're saying, ah, oh, he's an old man. And we get this picture of the old man in the sky uh, imagery of God, and that's silly. It's not trying to convey age. It's trying to convey the eternality of Jesus, the eternality of God when we see this, that he is ancient uh, in the most ancient of sense, and that he has no beginning, and that he has no end. Then we hear this description that he has the voice of many waters. This is often a biblical description for God's voice. Again, more messaging about who Jesus really is. Uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 43, verse 2 says, And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. If you've ever been near a massive waterfall, you know how loud and thunderous that that is. And its voice is so loud that no other voice can be heard. And that's really the picture here of the voice of God, uh, that when he speaks, no other voice can be he heard. If you're standing next to a big waterfall and it's big enough, you can shout and the person next to you can't hear you. And, and it's not really necessarily talking about the volume, but the power, the authority of God's voice, that it drowns out all other voices. All other voices are insignificant. And again, we've talked about this a little bit. Sword from his mouth. This is more the picture of authority uh, and the power of his words. We see this again in Revelation chapter 19. That, uh, and the picture there is very clear that when he comes to conquer, Jesus doesn't even have to lift a pinky to destroy his enemies. That even though there's the multitude, the mass, the millions that have gathered to fight against him, he battles against them and is victorious by one weapon alone, his word. That's all it takes. That Jesus does not need any kind of physical instrument or implement to help him. His words are that powerful. We know from uh, John chapter one, that he is the creator of all things, that uh, Colossians chapter one, verse 15, he is the creator of all things. And we see in Genesis that all things came by the spoken word. If Jesus can speak things into existence, he has the power to speak them out of existence. He doesn't need anything else. The sword is just simply imagery to point us to the power of his words. Again, not to show us that if you were to see Jesus, it would be this awkward moment of what's that hanging out your mouth? Uh, that it's very clearly Jesus's words have power. We see this in Hebrews 14, that the word of God is like a is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's powerful, it's penetrating. And then we see this next description is that his face was like the sun shining in strength. This is clearly the radiant glory of Jesus. This is the full on righteousness shining through. Uh, it's just like um, uh, the sun on a hot summer day that you cannot look directly into it. Well, you can, but you're not going to have much eyesight after that. You're going to do some serious damage. But this is that picture of the glory, the power, the wonder of Jesus. Uh, so in short, 
Jesus is no longer the humble servant that we see in the Gospels, but he is God. He's bursting forth with the glory and power of God. And folks, he is no longer sweet baby Jesus. Um, I hate that. Um, it is an insult. It is blasphemous. If you are praying that, stop. Uh, if you're saying that, stop. You are blaspheming the one who bought you with his blood, who set you free by his blood. He ain't sweet, sweet baby Jesus no more. Uh, he is the all-powerful, all-eternal God of the universe, and we see him in his glory here, and he is the one that we can stand confidently with because of his strength, because of his power, because he is in control. This is why we keep our eyes on him. This is why John is seeing him in the midst of persecution. This is why this revelation is given at the very beginning of Jesus, because he's about to reveal all the difficult things that are going to happen in the world from chapter six onward. And it's horrible. It's terrible. And, and it, if I'm right, that Christians will live through that time, the only way that we will make it through that, and the only way we make it through the most difficult times in this life, even when it's not great tribulation, is to keep our eyes on the all-powerful, almighty Jesus. He is the one that we serve. He is the one that we love because he first loved us, because he set us free, and because he has made us a kingdom and priest. Ha, ah, there is such goodness in this chapter. There's such confidence that comes from knowing who Jesus really is, not creating an idolatrous view of, I like to think of Jesus as. I, I like to think of Jesus as being sweet and cuddly. What Jesus, how Jesus reveals himself here to the very one who was with him at the Last Supper and had his head on his chest, the beloved disciple, when John saw him as he is now, he fell at Jesus' feet as though he were dead. That's how significant, how powerful Jesus really is. So we get a little bit of explanation of the vision. Uh, we hear Jesus say, I am the first and the last. Uh, this is exactly the same thing as saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, this is the name that God claims as his own. Uh, Isaiah 44, verse 6, that says, the Lord Yahweh, when you see that in all caps, actually all my letters are all caps, I'm sorry about that. Um, but L-O-R-D, anytime uh, you're looking at that in the uh, Old Testament, Whenever you see Lord in all caps, that behind that is the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. And that indicates that the Lord is um, that place marker there, that this is the sacred name of God. So thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. So if there is no other God, then there is no other God who has this name first and the last. And Jesus claims exactly this same name. And the only way that Jesus would be able to claim that name, a, a name that is sacred and unique to God alone, is if Jesus is exactly God. Nothing less, not a created God, but the God who is just as much first and last, Alpha and Omega, as the eternal God. And, and so this is an important claim that we see. So Jesus is not claiming to be another God, but the God. There is only one true God. And Jesus is claiming to be that God. And crazy thing is, heaven worships Jesus. And so the worship of Jesus in the book of Revelation underscores Jesus's claims of deity. And we even see the first hint of this worship the first mention of it in verse six. We're only six verses into the book of Revelation, and already Jesus is being worshiped to him, to Jesus, be glory and dominion forever and ever. And by the way, the him pronoun is clearly talking about Jesus. It is him that is being mentioned as having done all these things, uh, set us free by his blood and, and so forth. And then immediately following is another, he is coming back. Uh, and it's not a switch back to the Father and then suddenly a switch back. Language does not work that way. This is clearly in verse 6, Jesus being worshipped. One of the marvelous things that Revelation clearly demonstrates is that Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. This is such a powerful Christological book to give us an understanding, a right theology of who Jesus really is. 
Second thing we see that Jesus says, I am the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Um, and we see in John 1, 4, um, that Jesus says in him was life and the life was the light of men. Uh, Jesus is alive. And more than just simply being a living thing, he is the living one. He is the source of life and he is the conqueror of death. When he says that he holds the keys of death and Hades, doesn't mean that there are literally keys. That's a figurative way of saying, I've got the authority over death. Death answers to me. I control death. Death does not control me. I am the one more powerful than death and Hades. Second, his resurrection shows that he has the authorities. Got ahead of myself. The keys to death and Hades. The, and Hades is the holding place of the dead. We'll talk more about that when we get to um, what happens when we die. Um, he has the power to send people to death, and he has the power to deliver people from death. We ultimately see him destroy death and Hades in Revelation chapter 20. Third, Jesus holds the seven stars and walks among the seven golden lampstands, the seven candlesticks. Candlesticks, we're told very clearly, verse 20, candlesticks represent churches, plural. Now notice, we're the candle stand, we're not the light. Jesus is the light. We're the light bearers. And we bear the light when we live out Christ, when we live in relationship with Christ, and when we share the light with others. Our job as the church is not to be the light, is to show the light, to hold forth the light to a dark world. Second, the stars represent uh, the angels. Um, now, angels um, is the Greek word angelos, and um, the, the Greek word could it literally just means messenger. And so we're really not sure how to translate or interpret that. Uh, so a lot of translations will just simply put the word angel in there, but it could mean to a human messenger, like the pastor or the overseer of the church, or it could be some angelic representation or representative of the church. So maybe there's something being revealed that churches have an angel that's part of that whole equation, like a spiritual angel, uh, or it could possibly mean both. I tend to lean toward the physical human uh, messenger in this uh, because it says that he holds the seven stars in his right hand. Um, and so there's a message of hope and security and protection in that uh, for those who are in church leadership. Um, and then the third thing is uh, what we what it shows is that Jesus has this uh, deep, intimate connection to his churches and his authority and protection of the churches. So with him walking among the churches, what we're seeing is that Jesus is not distant from us. He's not observing from afar, but he's intimately connected to us. He knows exactly what's going on. And we see in chapters two and three, for better or worse, because he knows our junk, uh, but he also knows what we're doing well. And he is deeply concerned and intimately connected with how we're doing. We'll get more on that in the next uh, chapter. So just kind of a big takeaway from chapter one, stay focused on the true Jesus, not a made, not a made up version, not an idolatrous version, uh, not a limited version, but look full on and keep looking full on at Jesus. Don't get sidetracked by uh, the circumstances of life, by the troubles that's going on. If you're going through hard times right now, lift your eyes to Jesus. Look full in his glorious face. And as the old hymn goes, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Hmm. Uh, so uh, if you've got questions or comments, hope you'll leave, leave those below. I'd love to hear your feedback. What did I do well? What did you disagree with? Um, I can take it. Uh, go ahead and leave it. Um, and if you haven't, please um, leave a like. Uh, if you found anything at all helpful in this, uh, helps uh, YouTube to know that this can be helpful for other people as well. And make sure you subscribe so that you can catch some of the other episodes. And I hope you will. We've got several uh, in this series that are already out. So go ahead and find those and uh, look forward to hearing from you on those as well. Uh, but most of all, thank you for watching. I am really, really honored that you would take time to listen to me. <laughs> uh, but may the Lord richly bless you and Maranatha come Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless.